Well, hello everybody, welcome to Red Tool House. On today's video, we're gonna fire up the mill. I've got a friend coming down, he's bringing some logs, and I'm gonna help him mill those up. And uh, before he gets here, I wanted to try to do some, some basic maintenance on the mill, get it ready, and of course, uh, hopefully be in top shape when we're ready to tear into his logs and be as efficient as possible today. So, come follow along with us. So I've already pulled the covers off and pulled the blade off. Um, Yesterday, I actually sharpened it back up and uh, did a couple. There's actually a test that I'm trying, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that here in a second when we transition over to that process. But um, got everything pulled off here now. Just need to uh, add some grease. These uh, flywheels take some, take some grease, of course, to keep everything all nice and lubricated. And it's a funny thing about using this red <coughs> high performance grease from a distance. It looks like a daggone crime scene. <laughs> always freaks my wife out when I uh, come up to the house and I'm covered in it. She thinks I've killed somebody or cut a finger off. You may wonder, well, Troy, can you do it without getting it all over you? Nope. Not me. So one of the unique elements on the Norwood for tensioning is this this handle. You can see it's moving this wheel. So that's how we, of course, tighten up the blade. We push it in loose to put the new blade on it, and we pull it back to tighten it up. But we pull it back not by just jerking on it, but by twisting this handle, which then collapses a very, very heavy-duty spring in this mechanism. So it, it pulls all that assembly back. So what you have, so there's these two elements here that keep that all in place. Um, so there's a, there's a plate in here that, that slides back and forth. There's an adjustment. There's an adjustment inside here that I can reach with a socket to uh, to change the uh, the pitch or the camber of this wheel. But this assembly needs to be able to slide back and forth freely. So what uh, Norwood recommends is just shove some grease down in it. And I like to try to keep it coated with a lot of grease simply because. Uh, my mill sits outside, which is a whole nother discussion. So on the front of the carriage on both sides where the carriage rides on the rail are these little, tra I call them track sweepers, track lubricators. They're like a really heavy duty sponge. It almost feels like a, a heavy duty cardboard more so than a sponge. and. They've got a little notch in them, and as those ride on the carriage, then they just are constantly sweeping the rail. And the, the purpose of that, of course, is to provide lubrication so that the wheel glides smoothly, but it also keeps the sawdust and pitch from building up on the rail and creating speed bumps. If I don't tend to these very often and forget, then I'll notice, you know, when I'm pushing the carriage, I kind of feel, and that actually shows up, believe it or not, that shows up in the milling. If I, you've got any of these little variations that raise that carriage on one side or the other, then you can actually see that. You get this washboard effect on your milling, which is a drag, obviously. So what, what we do with those, you know, we've had a lot of rain here lately, and I usually leave those in, and there's some debate on whether you should do that or not, but I'm going to take them out and just soak them. This is where having spent motor oil always comes in handy. Like a little secret sauce we keep around here. <clears throat> I'm simply just going to lay those in. Let them drink in. Go on, drink it in. Now, as I mentioned before, some guys don't keep the, uh, the, the track sweepers in the mill at all times. For me, it's basically just an issue of ignorance because I forget about them and I run the mill without them, like, oh crap, I put those inside in a bucket. Um, that would make the most sense is a coffee can with a lid, oil inside. Um, at times I would do just like I'm doing here and leave them soaking and forget about them. We get a rain, of course, then you get the old sludgy, rainy oil, which is a real drag. So I just try to do this when I'm, I know I'm about to mill or I'm getting ready to, to get the mill fired up or do some other things around here, then I'll, I'll take them off and soak them and leave them right here so I can see them and hopefully I remember. 
Well, one other thing I do for, for basic maintenance is take my handy dandy little oiler here. And we have a, a tensioning cable that needs oiled right here in the mechanism that raises and lowers our saw carriage. So this is one of those engineering pieces on the LM29 that I wasn't too sure of. Having the Lumbermate 2000 uh, before, that's, that was what I was using as a reference. So this handle, of course, as many of you have seen, raises and lowers the blade. It has the engine block, has quite a bit of weight on it. So there's a pulley system that's used to uh, obviously give you mechanical advantage so you're not straining your guts out. But inside here, there's actually just a tiny little cable that's wrapped around this shaft a couple times. And um, you can actually, there's a tensioning handle right here that if I can tighten the tensioning of how, how tight that cable's wrapped around this shaft, or I can loosen it, and that allows the head to raise and lower easier. Obviously, if it was too loose, the head would just start to sink. Uh, while I'm milling, that would be a big issue. If it's too tight, then of course I can't turn it. So what we're supposed to do is just... Uh, Put a little bit of oil on that and just keep it lubricated. So that's what that hole is here for, is just a lubrication hole. So on the Lumbermate 2000 where you had these two main masts that everything slid up and down on, you, you had this handle mechanism that you would turn just very similar to this and it would use a garage door spring. So when you, when you put the kit together you'd have to tension that garage door spring and man that was intimidating as anything because you're taking these big pull handles and you're just tightening and tightening and tightening. If you let go of that thing, it's going to it's going to do a daffy duck on you. It's going to swack you in the beak about 16 times before you can get away from it. So I like the fact that you don't have to use the garage door springs, um, but even with that, as you raise and lowered, it had these two little T-handles, a kind of smaller version of this, that you'd have to tighten. So it would put these uh, phenolic you know, plastic inserts, it would press them against the mass so it wouldn't slide up and down. So each time you adjust, you had to reach and tighten that. So that I can see where Nora's like, eh, that engineering's not the greatest because you're having to have that touch point every time. So I was a little reluctant about this, seeing this little tiny cable is going to keep everything in place. Uh, but it actually works so much better than the Lumbermate 2000. So I think this is a definite upgrade in their engineering. I really like it. You know, this mill's two years old now, and this carriage stays exactly where I want it to. The saw head stays exactly where I want it to. It doesn't raise and lower. Obviously, it's not going to raise. It doesn't lower when I'm in process of milling. So that's really all the maintenance you need to do to the mill in between operations. Now, of course, every so often need to change the oil. The one thing I do have to do, since I use uh, rain catchment water for my, my lubrication uh, tank here, is uh, I sometimes have to take this apart and blow the uh, tadpoles out of it. <laughs> sometimes we get some mosquito larvae, sometimes we get some algae buildup, sometimes we get a tadpole. Sometimes I end up swallowing one of them. But... Um, Usually just clean that out and, and then we're ready to get rolling. So let me go show you what I'm doing with the blades this time. So I still have my sharpener set up. Uh, like I said, I was using this last night. And I'm not going to detail how we use this. Uh, I've already done a video to that. I'll link to it here. But one thing this sharpener does, the very mechanics of it, when it's sharpening a blade, let's imagine my hand is the face of the tooth. So what the sharpener is doing is it's coming up the back of the tooth and then drops down the face. So you're kind of doing this climb the mountain and then shear off the face of the mountain and then it even even rides up the gullet to come up to the next back of the tooth. So it has this process of up and down and and what we do is we sharpen one first go around and then we readjust and come back and we sharpen the other on the next go around. So there's two things and this is actually where I'm going to run a test today with these blades and see. Norwood sent me a, a, a ton of blades so even though I've had this mill for two years and I've run a lot of wood through it, I'm really not to the point where I'm even running blades through multiple times with multiple sharpenings. In fact, this is the first blade that gets a second sharpening simply because I put it back in the front of rotation. Because with that process of riding up and down, that cam on the sharpener isn't exactly the profile of this blade. So there's times that it, it rides up fine and it even does the face fine, but it's not cleaning the gullet. And, and sometimes doesn't come cleanly up the back. Um, sometimes it misses the very tip. There's just little things as it, as you sharpen it more, then it should start to make the blade more the shape of the cam's movement, if that makes any sense. So the more I sharpen this blade, the more it assumes the shape of that cam's movement. So this is blade second time sharpening. So just in doing that again, I've noticed it has more contact, the stone has more contact with the blade the second time around, which makes sense. So we'll see how that does that increases performance there. 
And then this blade, this blade is the first sharpening. And so I was actually a little more aggressive with the stone on this and noticed as it was coming up the back of the tooth, it actually created a burr. So if you guys are familiar with you know, sharpening stuff, you, know, you, you obviously get that little bit of metal that, that is residue or is, is, is what's remaining. And it's real, real thin and it, it has a, it's called a burr. Uh, so when you sharpen knives or you sharpen anything, you've got that burr on, um, you know, it could be microscopic at some degree, or it could be very, very tangible. And these, they were very tangible. The burr, if this is the tooth, the burr was facing this way. So it kind of came up and did a little 45. So no matter how I tried to clean the face, it just wouldn't completely take that burr off. So what I did is I have a second Dremel tool with a, a horizontal stone, and I just came through while it was on the rig and just simply turned that burr. So... If this is the face of the tooth and the burr is sticking out this way, I simply took that Dremel tool and I just, just removed the burr. So when I go through with my thumb and feel that, it's a very, very sharp tip and it doesn't have the burr. The little that I know about sharpening would tell me that you know, when you have that burr, as soon as that burr gets turned back as it runs through the wood, then you've just dulled that that much quicker. So being able to make that burr as small as possible is the deal. You guys can't see it, but there's stupid mice are playing with one another right behind me. I've got to get a cat down here in the workshop. They're doing tag right behind the camera. Anyway, um, so getting that burr removed or minimized as much as possible should uh, hopefully keep the, the blade sharper longer. Now, again, you got to watch. don't want to keep removing more and more material. There's only so much carbide tip on this tooth before this blade becomes worthless. But we're going to try these. We're going to try both of these blades today and just, just get an idea of how they run. So the first blade I'm going to start with is the blade that's been sharpened twice. So it's had more stone contact on it. And when I look at the face, I can see it's pretty sharp. Now this has a little bit of a burr on it. So this will be a good test to see if that burr makes a difference. So we're going to toss this one on here. And you guys laugh at how I do this because this isn't the best way. But Rather not take a saw blade in the face. Sinatone. So since Mark hasn't made it here yet, I'm going to try one of the things, just, just morbid curiosity test here. I've got a magnet that I can stick a screw through, and we're going to stick that right there. We're going to check, I want to check the bed. Um, you'd be surprised, you, you may think, well, if, it's, if this bed warps, then it's got to be cheap. But you'd be surprised, even my Lumbermate 2000, they had a much, much stronger bed. Over time, they just start to sag a little, especially if you don't keep it level. That's the whole point and all the effort in keeping the saw bed level is that it doesn't sag. And another thing that people don't realize is that a log, can't tie a knot and talk at the same time clearly, is a log when it's green, or even when it's not green, 
if it's laying on something uneven, it's going to start to take that shape. It's still a, a green plant. So if this thing has a smiley face in it or a frowny face, then that log's going to resemble that. And when I go to mill it, then I get thicker ends on my wood. <laughs> so here, here you go, people. This is proof that Red Toolhouse is unscripted. So um, I thought putting this on here, I'd be like, yeah, it's, it's all right. You know, I've just kind of proven a point, blah, blah, blah. Actually, I've discovered something that needs a little bit bigger correction than just an adjustment. So I've got just the tiniest little gap between this string and the bunk here. And the same with this one. So these two are just a cat's whisker lower than everybody else. But if you can see, I think I framed it out in the shot. There's a jack stand there and a jack stand here. This is the biggest spread, the biggest gap I have on the entire mill of the jack stands. So what I need to do is jack this end up and move these stands actually down here. They're made that I can uh, take a set screw from behind out, slide it down, and they need to be needs to be a little bit further this way, so probably bring it all the way down to here. I'm not sure why I tucked it so close to the axle when the other one's just on the other side of the axle, but I don't know. So uh, I'll need to correct that. Again, not a huge issue, I mean, not even a sixteenth of an inch, but that does show up. That does create an opportunity to have odd-shaped wood, so I do need to get that corrected. Here come the logs. All right, as you guys saw, we just uh, dumped a uh, ton of logs here. This is my friend Mark and his son Daniel. Say hi, Mark Daniel. Hi, Mark Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> You've been on this channel before. <laughs> so I found out today that Daniel does watch the channel. So he, he knows what to expect here at Red Tool House, that we'll do a lot of standing around, a lot of talking. Probably won't get as much wood milled as we'd like to, but that's the way it works. But uh, so Mark brought us some really nice, big red oak. Been on the ground a little bit. We've already cut up one and produced some, some really pretty wood. So we're going to try to take on this big boy here. This is going to be the, this is going to be tax the mill a little bit as far as getting it on there, but we'll see how it goes. I think it'll be, uh, be millable. How big did you say this was? 10 feet long? 10 foot. 10 and a half? Yeah. So, so it's good looking wood. We can smell the red oak. This is where I wish I had smell vision You guys could pick up on this, but uh, let's get her loaded up.
Well, all right, so the experiment with the sharpening, turning the burr really made the difference, which, which makes sense, um, I believe, in looking. So this is the blade. This is the blade that did not have the burr turned. It was an aggressive sharpen, so we had a really fine point, but we did have a decent burr. And it went dull pretty quickly on that first log that we did, which we, we didn't film. The time lapse that you saw was using the second blade, and that's the one I turned the burr on. And it actually could have continued a little bit longer, uh, but we were starting another big log, didn't want to be halfway through it and have to, to switch at that point. But just noticed, you know, bigger chips, it lasted longer. So you know, turning the burr, which, which again makes sense that that burr most likely is getting bent down and dulling or bent up and dulling. And it's just, um, if we remove it, then it takes care of the situation. All right, so we put it in our log pile. We, we had six, we're down to three, and we're gonna call it a day. We got a decent stack of nice long red oak here. That's almost, that's almost 13 feet long. And then over here in Mark and Daniel's dump truck, a lot of good looking stuff. So we milled some four quarter, we milled some three quarter, and there's some red oak and there's some pin oak in here. Got a ton of rick boards for him so he can stack them up and dry them. And uh, haven't calculated board feet, and I'm probably not going to, but it's a pretty good, pretty good mess there. So out of three logs, um, you may have seen in that time lapse that one log was a bit uh, of a monster force. It kicked our butts a little bit. All right, well, I appreciate Mark and Daniel coming down, and appreciate you watching the channel, man. That's all right. You're not the one that criticizes me all the time under a pseudonym, are you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Well, we appreciate uh, you guys watching. Had a blast making sawdust, and we'll do some more videos later on. All right, take care, everybody.